Do you think the odds of you being a complainer go up or go down? You know, you are where you are in life today because of how you think. And in order to change your thinking, you've got to get around people who think different from you. If you don't, if you don't change who you hang around, you will be the same person next year. You have to change how you think. The Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind. You know, everything in life is based on how you think. And so if you want to change that, you've got to change your thinking. And get around people who think differently than you, who think bigger than you. I've been in so many different meetings over the last few years, and I got in rooms with people who were thinking, I was embarrassed of how small I was thinking. Like I was just thinking so small. You know, it reminds me of the story of the, the you guys have heard me share it before maybe, of the, the businessman who developed a friendship with one of the kings in the Middle East. And after being there several months with the king, he had to come back to the States. And the king said, I want to give you a gift. And he said, what do you want? He goes, I don't want anything. He said, no, I want to give you a gift. It's our custom. I want, to, I want to give, you're my friend. I want to give you a gift. He said, I like golf. And so he went back to the States and several months went by and he got a package at the door and about this high and big square box. And he saw it was from the king. He opened it up, pulled out this big tube. And he's like, I don't know what he got me. He must, you know, he got me a golf club or something. So he, he opens it up and he, it's a big sheet of paper and he rolls it out. And the king didn't buy him a golf club. He bought him a golf course. And for all of us who thought it was a golf club, that's what I mean by thinking small. We don't think like kings. Kings don't give golf clubs, they give golf courses. And the reason some of us don't give to the Lord is because you think God gives the way you give. God, God's a king. Come on, can I get an amen about that? We serve a king. He doesn't give like you. He gives his life. This is what... Paul refers to as the exceeding greatness of God. And so I want to encourage you. Um, this is something we made available. And so if it's, that's you, you can talk to Trey. If it's not, then it's not. But lift your hand. Say it like you mean it. Come on, say in Jesus' name. I sow a seed of faith into good ground. Let it bless the kingdom and let it bless my life. I now rebuke every spirit of debt, lack, want, poverty, sickness, disease, shyness, insecurity, timidity, anxiety, depression, and fear. I now release the favor of God, the blessings of God, joy, peace, health, healing, creativity, courage, insight, revelation, thought, entrepreneurship, unity. I prophesy all of my children all of my grandchildren will spend eternity in heaven with me. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to minister the word of the Lord to you today. And I really have some things that are very challenging and difficult. Um, but I want to challenge you to not lose the awareness that all of us one day will stand before the Lord and to give an account for the condition of our heart. All of us are going to stand before the Lord one day and explain why our heart is the way that it is. And as a pastor uh, for over 20 years, you know, I could take this platform and I could use it to point out things that I think are wrong in people and point out things that I see that are wrong in people and things that are wrong in other churches and things that are wrong in people's lives we could do that but I've discovered that at the age of 45 years old and I've probably most likely have lived um, over half of my life that I have a lot of work to do in my own soul 
in my own heart. And it's becoming more real to me how much more I need the Lord to do in my own heart. And the reality of standing before the Lord one day is becoming more and more real to me. I don't know, you know, I know to, to some of you, 45 is really old, and some of you, 45 is a baby. But whether it's age or not, I know and have a sense that we are in the last days. And I am becoming less and less concerned about what's wrong with people and more concerned about what's wrong with me. I'm becoming less concerned about what's wrong with other people's hearts. Some people are so concerned about what's wrong with other people's hearts they can't serve Jesus. Some people are so concerned about what's wrong with other churches and other people's hearts that they can't give to the Lord, serve the Lord, be a part of the family of God because they're so tied up and consumed with what's wrong with other people rather than looking at their own heart. And the reality is we are all going to stand before the Lord one day. And let me tell you, I know some of you are very young, but listen to me. The older you get, the more you become aware that you're going to stand before God and you're going to give an account to the Lord for the life you lived. And Paul talks about this in speaking of the realm of authority, that there are things that I can speak to in the body of Christ that are under my authority. There are subjects and things I could speak to that are outside of my authority. But when Paul gets to the end of his life, he says, you know, I finished my race. I kept the faith. I, I finished my calling, my work. God's not called you to finish somebody else's race. He called you to finish your race. And if you want to run straight, quit looking at the person next to you. And look at the path and the plan that God has for your life. And I think we need to get our eyes off of people and get our eyes on ourselves and Jesus. Because when you see the Lord, he makes you see you. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. And then the Bible says he saw himself. And he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell amongst the people that are unclean. For my eyes have seen the king. See, when you see Jesus, he makes you see you. All the people who are so consumed about other people are people who are not seeing the Lord. Because when you really see Jesus, he makes you see you. And you realize how much of you is not like him. And it makes you run to him with humility. It's like the woman who they went to stone and they saw her sin and they said, she has sin. You know, the law says that we should kill her. And Jesus said, he who has no sin, let him cast the first stone. So all of them were looking at someone else's sin. As soon as they encounter Jesus, Jesus makes them look at their own. This is the ministry of Jesus. This is the ministry of the scriptures. Because the scriptures are a mirror that make you look at yourself. That's why a lot of people don't want to read the Bible. Because the Bible makes you see you. And I taught you last week, what are the three things I taught you last week to overcome temptation? What was the first one? You remember? Come on, it's only been six days. Solitude. Everybody say solitude. Solitude. Not isolation. If you get offended, Satan will move you into isolation and he will begin to pastor you. And all of you know a person who does not attend the church because they were offended. And now they live in isolation and Satan pastors them. Solitude with the Lord, an hour, two hours with Jesus. Jesus rebukes his own disciples for not spending an hour in prayer. Time with the Lord. Everybody say solitude. solitude. What was the second weapon? Prayer. Come on, what was it? Prayer. prayer. Jesus said when you pray, not if. Prayer. Getting in the presence of God and praying. <laughs> Do it. Abiding. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you will and it shall be given unto you. He that dwelleth in the secret place, Psalms 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the what? Shall what? 
abide. You cannot abide if you don't dwell in secret. He that dwelleth in the secret place shall abide. So all the people who say, you can just be, you just abide all day, just abide all day, but they don't have a prayer time. They don't have a secret place. That's unbiblical. You cannot abide if you don't dwell in secret. Sounds good. It's a good reel on Instagram. It's not godly. Because they don't know the scriptures. What's the last one? What, what is it? The scriptures. And I challenge you to learn what? Five verses. Learn five verses. If you didn't learn five verses, learn them this week. Five verses. Five verses. This is a cult. I can't believe they would make me learn the Bible. This is crazy. Yeah, five verses. Learn five verses of the word of God. And if you learn five, praise God. Learn five more. What? Five more? It's ten. How's anybody ever going to be able to, how am I going to be able to be on social media for eight hours and learn the Bible? <laughs> learn the Bible. You want to be a part of a church where your pastor te- challenges you to learn the word of God. Amen. We need to speak in the authority that God has given us. That, what does that mean? That means don't be picking up everybody's cause. Just because you see somebody, they're passionate to do it, and you go, oh, that looks good, let me do that. If you don't have an anointing to do it, you can ruin your life. Amen. Don't just pick up every, up every anthem and pick up every cause just because it's trending. Some of you get involved in things you have no business getting involved in because you're, and you're trying to speak on matters for which you have no authority. And when you do that, you cause division in your life. And you cause chaos in your world. And chaos in your home because you're doing things for which you have no authority. Finish your race. The things that God has called you to do. Somebody say amen. And do it without sin. The Bible says just one fly in the ointment ruins the ointment. One fly in the anointing oil ruins the anointing. Well, it's just a little sin. No. You cannot live a life of sin. And have the life of Christ living on the inside of you. People who tell you that do not know the scriptures. They do not know the word of God. Jesus said, I came to set you free from sin, not a little sin, not half of your sin, not 25% of your sin, not 99% of your sin. He came to set you free from all of your sin. To God be the glory. Who wants to be a, a little less of a slave? I'm not a slave to sin anymore. Can I get an amen about that? He whom the Son is set free is free indeed. Don't let people lie to you just because it sounds nice. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, We will all give an account for everything done in the body. Put the verse up. 2 Corinthians 5.10. We will all. Somebody say, you're going to give an account. Do you know you will stand before God and you will give an account for everything you did in that body? Everything you did in your body, every action, you will give an account to God for the actions you did in your body. And not just the things that we did or didn't do. This is very terrifying. But Paul begins to talk about not just the actions, but the motive. That God knows the heart behind your action. That every sermon we preach, God knows the motive behind it. Every offering we take as a church, God knows the motive behind it. Every event we do, God knows the motive behind it. Every social media post, God knows the motive behind it. Everything we do. The, that's a terrifying reality. So when you have so, people taking pictures and they post on social media, why are you posting that? Is that going to help people come closer to Jesus? Or is that just going to build my page? What's the motive behind it? What is the heart behind it? That you could give, somebody could write a check today and give to buy all the chairs for the Andover campus, pay for all the new carpets, somebody could do it. But if they did it with the wrong heart, God won't receive it. 
Now we'll receive it. We'll still take the check. Amen. Because I don't know the motive. We'll buy the chairs and the carpet with it. But God knows the heart. Whether you did that to get close to pastor, you did that because you're trying to be seen, you're doing that to be noticed, you did that for some reason. What was the heart behind it? What was the motive behind it? Well, I'm going to win people for Jesus, but videotape me so I can post it on social media. I'm not winning people. Here, I'm giving to homeless people. Videotape me so I can. I'm not, I'm not saying that, I'm not judging somebody's heart who did that. I'm saying God is. I'm saying God is looking at the motive. Everything that we do, God is looking at the motive that we're going to give an account for every action we do in the body. Can somebody say amen about that? I'm preaching today. Am I preaching because it's my job? Or am I preaching because I love the body of Christ? If I get a paycheck next week, am I going to quit? You better, you better not think for once I would quit. I did this for free for many years. Gave to the church when the church couldn't pay its own bills. That's why I, that's why I always watch staff. If staff all of a sudden doesn't get a paycheck, do they quit? So they were here for a paycheck? God's not looking for employees. God's looking for dead people. We got young people now. Some of them in the internship want me to hire them to work for the church. I said, why is your dream to work for the church? Your dream should never be to work for the church. God is not looking for an employee. God is looking for someone who is dead to themselves that he can use for his glory. That's what he's looking for. What is your cross? What are you willing to sacrifice for, for him? It's quiet. God is looking for dead people that he can live through. This is why Paul says, I am crucified with, with who? With Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Psalms 139, verse 23. Learn this verse. Search me, O God. Everybody say, search me. Oh, it's a terrifying verse. Search me. Know my heart. Search me. What if God searched your heart right now? What if God searched our hearts? Every time we get ready to worship, this is what the psalmist pray. Search me, O God. If there be any darkness in me, if there be anything in me that would not be like you, purify me and wash me and cleanse me. Search me, O God. This is a beautiful prayer to pray in the morning. Everybody say, search me, O God. Know my heart. Know my heart. And I think as we approach the coming of the Lord, this is very important. Because I don't want to be ashamed when I stand before him at the throne. I don't want my works to be burned up in the fire. Because I did it all for myself. This is where God knows the heart. And all that you did, you're going to stand before God one day, you and I. And all that you did is going to go through a fire. And if you did it with the wrong motive, the wrong heart, it's going to be burned up. And only what you did with the right heart and the right motive will last and stand the test of time and stand for eternity. Can I get an amen about that? So we have to get our eyes off other people and get our eyes on the condition of our own heart because we will not survive the days ahead ahead if the word of God does not dwell richly in our heart. And how can the word of God dwell richly in your heart if you will not sit under it? How will the word of God dwell richly in your heart if you will not read it? How will the word of God dwell richly in your heart if you will not memorize it? You can do what I'm trying to memorize the book of John this year. Do it with me. What? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. I got hundreds of songs I could play on these speakers that you know all of them. 
Some of them you wasn't even born when them songs was written. And you know them all. How do you know it? You gave your time to it. You gave your heart to it. It's written upon your heart to the point that if I played it right now, it would move your body. You learn them. How'd you learn them? You listen to them over and over and over again. Listen to the word of God. Write it upon your heart that you may not, what? Sin against the Lord. I want to talk to you about something today that you don't hear a lot about in church. And I want to talk to you about commitment. Everybody say commitment. I want to talk to you about commitment. My wife and I, um, I heard, I heard this, this, this sermon probably a decade ago, and then my wife heard it last Sunday, and we both felt the Lord wanted us to minister it today on commitment. Um, a lot, most of this is from uh, Pastor Benny Hinn that I want to share today because it's so ministered to my heart. And I want to talk to you today about commitment. Everybody say commitment. Amen. And the benefits of commitment spiritually and naturally. The membership is not a name on a list. It's not about a role. The membership is about what God can do through someone who is committed. Committed to his family. And that God chose Adam's family. Adam did not choose his family. God chose Adam's family. And in the spirit, it's the same thing. God chooses our families in the spirit. People just show up one Sunday, they're your brother. We used to call people that in church, brother, sis, sister, brother Nico, sister, so, so. Anybody remember church it used to be like that? To, that's how you stood. And God builds your family. How many have physical, how many people have natural brothers and sisters? You didn't get to pick them, did you? Your parents just came to you one day and said, hey, we got news for you. And they just showed up, and you had to share your toys and share everything, right? And that's a family. And the church is the family of God. Hear me, the church is the visible representation of the invisible kingdom of God. So in the sight of God, the church is very important. In the realm of the spirit, God has given us local assemblies, which are the visible expression of the invisible family of God. And the Lord gave us local churches for what? To be the visible expression of the family of God. That's what we are today. We are the visible expression of the family of God. And so in the early church, communities had just one local assembly. That's why you had the church at Corinth or the church at Philippi. They just had one gathering, one place. In, in, in the early church. So a whole city would have just one gathering. But today there's many uh, local churches in, a, in each community. And that's why today a lot of people are not committed to a house of faith and they are not used to a local assembly. So people come when they want. They leave without warning, without accountability. And in many ways they bring themselves into a lot of trouble with the Lord. And the Lord wants us to be committed to the body for many reasons. God cares a lot about the body. He talks about it, um, how they number, 120, 3,000, 5,000. And the reason God cares about the people is that's his family. David got in trouble for counting. One of David's biggest sins was he counted the people. And God judged him harshly because he took credit for the size of the people. Not the Lord. Can I get an amen about it? As I tell the, how many people, I don't even want to know how many people came to church. I don't even want, don't even tell me how many visitors we had. I don't even want to know. What I want to know is how strong was his presence in the room. This is a big difference from how I did church for a long time. And there's a great benefit that's given to us in Scripture. We are committed to the house of God. And the church today, um, many people uh, have, have no accountability in the most important area of their life, which is their spiritual life. You know your spiritual life is more important than your physical life? It's more important than your financial life. It's more important than any other area of your life. 
is your, is your spiritual. How many people agree your spiritual life is the most important area of your life? Most people in the most important area of their life have no accountability. I have, now, I have, I have a board that I've given accountability to that looks out for Joanne and I. They, they watch over our marriage. They call us, how is your marriage? They, we meet with them throughout the year. Tell us how your marriage is. We've been praying, God showed us this, we need to talk about this, we need to fix this. This is wrong, you need to get this cleaned up. This is a, this is a problem. This is not okay, we gotta change this. My marriage, in every area of life. Talk to me about how we handle this. Talk to me about the church. This, we gotta do this, let's, let's not do that. This is, we, we got accountability here. This is what the word says over there. I have, I, have, I have a whole group of people who I'm accountable to. Who do you have in your life? Who, who do you have in your life that you're accountable to? And then we wonder why our children don't, don't see us or are accountable to us because we've not modeled it. Children are terrible at doing what you ask them to do. They're amazing at doing what they see you do. Wow. But this is the word of the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen? Who do you have in your life that you, that you allow spiritual authority over? This is important. So when people have no, no authority in their life, this is not spiritual. This is not God's way. And listen to me. Our commitment to the church reveals our commitment to the Lord. What? Yeah. Your commitment to the family of God reveals your commitment to Jesus. Amen. Psalm 68 and 6. Learn this. Psalm 68 and 6. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. You guys ready? God setteth the solitary in families. It means God puts people in families. God puts you in a family. And he does it to bring out people who are bound with chains. So only in the family will chains come off. Do you see that verse? Only in the family of God will chains of addiction and generational curses be broken in your life. He brings out those that are bound with chains. So the church is a place of freedom. Everybody say the church is a place of freedom. Not bondage. Bondage is outside of the church. Do not see the church as a building. See it as the people. The church is the people. Everybody say, we are the church. Yeah. People say, oh, the church, I'm church hurt. I got hurt by church. The church didn't hurt you. People hurt you. People say, I got hurt by, I said, did I hurt you? No. Well, well I'm a part of the church. I didn't hurt you. So it wasn't the church that hurt you. It was the person that hurt you. But why do, you, why, do you, why do you say it like that? As if all of us, everybody here doesn't even know who you are. Amen? Amen. We are the church, the people. So when you see the church as the people of God, you see it rightly. And then he brings them out. Out of what? Out of the world. Put the verse back up. Out of the world. Right? But what does it say? But the rebellious, everybody say the rebellious, dwell in a dry land. No food, no water, no anything. Listen to me. The enemy is attracted to dryness. Demons are attracted to dryness. Listen to what Jesus says in the book of Matthew. He says when an evil spirit comes out of a man, that evil spirit goes into dry places. Read it in the book of Matthew. When, whenever somebody gets delivered from a demonic spirit, that demonic spirit goes into dry places. And where do the rebellious live? In a dry land. When you are rebellious to the family of God, you will live in dryness. And you do things that attract demonic behavior to your life. Wow. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. I don't want to dwell, dwell in a dry land. Can I get an amen? I want to be planted. Anybody else want to be planted? 
Psalms 92, verse 10 through 15. But my horn you have exalted like the wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. Everybody say fresh oil. My eyes also have seen my desire of my, on my enemies and my ears. Hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. How many of you want to flourish like a palm tree? Yes. Now, my family's from the Bahamas. We have palm trees. And when a hurricane comes, those palm trees can bend all the way over in a storm. And they come back. You know why? Because they're planted. And they have a root system. So they can survive the storms because of their roots. Every time you uproot and go to another church, it's like uprooting a tree. And when you uproot a tree, you put the tree in shock. Anybody's ever, I, I tried to move a few trees last year. We tried to move four of them. Three of them didn't make it. Three of them didn't make it. They told me, oh, they'll make it, they'll make it, they'll make it. You know the first thing they asked me when they got ready to move the trees? They said, how long has the tree been here? Because how long it's been there has a lot to do with whether it will survive. And I said, this is how long it's been there. Because we had put the trees in. And they said, yeah, we think, we think we'll make it. We moved four of them. Three of them didn't make it. And I could tell they weren't making it because they got brown. They started getting dry. Dry. And so, you know what we did? We took water and we just soaked them like all day. And it didn't matter how much water we put on them because the roots wouldn't take it. So no matter how much YouTube you watch, no matter how many sermons you listen to, you still dry because no matter how much water we put on you, the roots are in shock. So you want to stay planted. A lot of people aren't planted. They're potted. Some people are like, I look at them and I say, how long have you been saved? They say, oh, I've been saved 50 years. And I said, how come you? I said, you just move here? They said, no, no, I've been in Minnesota all my life. I said, how long have you been saved? 50 years. I said, oh. They tell me they've been to 50 churches. They're like a bonsai tree. <laughs> They're small, but they, they look old. You know what I mean? Like they look like something wrong. Something, you should be big. You should be like, you know, like the cedars of Lebanon, the Bible says. Like something, something don't look right. And some people want to be potted, and they run after good weather. Oh, it's raining over there. Like, I need some rain. So I'm going to go over there. And then they get the rain. All it does is rain over here. <laughs> My gosh, the rain. I need some sun. And then they go, oh, it's the sun over there. And then they run over here, it's the sun. And they ne you, you have never eaten fruit from a tree that was potted. They, they are fruitless. You shall flourish, verse 12. Like a palm tree, you shall grow like the cedars of Lebanon. Those that are what? Planted. Those that are what? Planted. Come on, church. Those that are what? Planted. Planted. Where? In the, in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of the God. They shall still, still bear fruit in there. How many of you want to bear fruit in your old age? Come on. Away with this. Oh, I used to be involved. I used to really... Back when I used to, I used to really do things in church, but now I'm 60 and I can't do, what a sorry story that is. I, 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 what a, don't tell young people that. It sounds like we got nothing to look forward to. The Bible says your latter days shall be greater than your former days. I want to be like Tommy Barnett at 86 preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on, anybody else with me on that? I, I, wanna, I want my latter years to be more fruitful than my younger years. So membership is not meaning you're on some list or oh, I'm a tither or I'm a volunteer. No, it's spiritual. And you, when you refuse the fellowship of the saints, you refuse the protection of the Lord. What? Where's that in the Bible? 
Let's look at it. Verse, verse 13. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God. They shall bear fruit in their old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. So how many of you want spiritual authority? Come on, can I get any? How many of you want fresh oil in your life? Then you've got to be planted in the house of the Lord. Isaiah 4, 5. Let's talk about the protection of God. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 5. Then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the church. Above every dwelling place and above her assemblies. That's what we're doing today. A cloud. What's the cloud do? To guide, to protect you from the sun. And the smoke by day and a shining flame of fire by night to protect you from the wolves. For over all the glory, there will be a protection and a covering. God protects me when I'm planted. There's a protection in being planted in the house of the Lord. Well, they're trying to control me. No one is trying to control your life. We are trying to help you establish your life. To be established. How many of you want to be established in the house of God? The Bible says you have 10,000 instructors, but very few fathers. Why are there very few fathers? Because very few men and women are willing to be established. We want God to bless you and to use you. Hebrews 10, 21 through 25. This is why you need the body of Christ. Put it on the screen. Hebrews 10, verse 25. And having a high priest over the house of God, let what? Let's read it again. Having high priest over the house of God, let what? There's, it's that little word. Two letters. Let what? Us. Come on, everybody say it. Let what? Us. Not you. But us. Draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who is promised is faithful. Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up the love and the good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day of the Lord approaching. This is not God's, com this is God's command, not his advice. Amen. This speaks of unity. Everybody say us. us. Well, I just, it's just me and Jesus. I don't need the church. I can't stand these people. Me and you, Jesus. No, no, no. This is ungodly. That is not in the Bible. You cannot keep the faith on your own. We need each other. Amen. Nowhere in those scriptures does God tell you to keep the faith on your own. You will not see that. You will hear that from people who isolate from offense. The word of God is about the body, is, it about, is about us. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. He is our priest. Let us hold fast. Let us provoke one another in love. You cannot have fellowship with God if you do not have fellowship with his body. Wow! You cannot have fellowship with the Lord if you do not have fellowship with the body of Christ. 1 John 1 and 3. That which you have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also have fellowship with what? With us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. My fellowship with the church allows me to fellowship with the Lord. That's what that verse means. My fellowship with the body of Christ allows me to fellowship with the Lord. We preach to you so that you may have fellowship with us and fellowship with the Lord. So to fellowship with God, you cannot cut off the church. It is his body. And we need each other. Everybody say, we need each other. And without fellowship with God and each other, listen to me, you will never know the power of the blood. Verse 6 and 7, same chapter put on the screen. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we what? Do not listen to people who tell you that they have fellowship with the Lord and they live in sin. You see that verse on the screen? 
If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we what? We lie. So way with this people who are saying like, oh yeah, you can just sin and have a great relationship with Jesus. It doesn't matter. That's not in the word of God. It may sound great. You may get a lot of likes on an Instagram reel, but it's not the truth. We lie and do not practice the what? The truth. How can you have fellowship with the invisible if you won't have it with the visible? How's that going to work? We are his extension on earth and the blood of Jesus without the church, hear me, the blood of Jesus without the church has no power according to verse 6 and 7. And the blood of Jesus Christ and his son cleanses us. What's the verse? Put verse 7 up. If we walk in the light and he is the light and we have fellowship one with another, then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Do you see that verse? So how are you? People, people want to be cleansed, but they don't want the body. You have to. How are you going to love pastor and not love pastor Joanne? Who in here amongst us is going to have a relationship with somebody who hates your spouse? Who you would die for? Or hates your children? The blood of Jesus has power over the enemy. And the devil laughs at you when you say you are connected to the Lord, but you're not connected properly under covering to the body of Christ. And yes, it's been messed up and people talk about the church or they hate the church or gossip about the church or offended at the church. But the fellowship with the Lord helps us understand the blood and helps us walk in the light. In the light, in the fellowship. We cannot walk in fellowship and have darkness. This is the word of God. Is anybody hearing this today? This is the word of the Lord. I'm teaching you this because there's, a, there's, there's this mindset out there of individualism that's being taught to this generation that you do not need the body of Christ. It's just you and Jesus. And that is not in the Bible. It may sound good for social media. It is not the truth. It is not backed up with Scripture. And the reason you fall for it is because it sounds good to your flesh. It sounds good to your fleshly, earthly desires and not the cross and scripture and crucifixion. And this is why you need to understand spiritual authority in the body of Christ. Can I get an amen about it? Acts 9.18, I'm almost done. Acts 9.18, and immediately, this is talking about the Apostle Paul, and immediately there fell from his eyes scales. And he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. So this is Paul. When Paul was saved, he, what was the next thing that happened to him? He was what? Baptized. Everybody say baptized. You need to be water baptized. This is how you join the church. I'm not talking about your name on a roll. I'm talking about being a part of the family of God. This is what brings you into covenant. This seals your covenant. Through water baptism. Verse 26, the same chapter. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him. You know, because he was like the Osama bin Laden. He was like killing Christians and he got saved. So they were terrified of him still. And they did not believe that he was a disciple. They're like, you go see Agnes if he's saved. You go and you tell us. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. So Barnabas, who is another believer, took him. See, you need the body of Christ. Another brother took him by the hand and, and led him and declared. He said, listen, I know him. I have seen him on the road. And he, he has spoken and he has preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with him in Jerusalem and coming in and out. He was coming to church and he spoke boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. And they, the people in the city began to, 
the, the Hellenists, they hated him. And they attempted to kill him. Verse 30, put verse 30 up. But when the church found out, when the brethren, when the brethren found out that the people in the city were trying to kill Paul, they, they brought him, they took him and rescued him and brought him down to Caesarea and put him in Tarshish. The church saved his life. The church, there is a protection in the family of God. Nowhere in those scriptures do you see God pulling people out and, 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 and just pulling them to him and, and nothing to do with the church and hating the church and, and tearing down the church and deconstructionists. And nowhere in the scriptures does anybody have a gift to destroy the church or tear down the church. Or ridicule the church. People like that on social media, don't follow them. Don't have anything to do with them because they contaminate your soul. None of you are called to destroy another brother or sister in Christ. Even if they're wrong, let God judge them. Let God deal with them. It's not our job to put our mouth on other people and destroy people. Come on, can I get an amen and tear down the body of Christ? That's not the work of the Lord. Even if they're wrong, then pray for them and let God deal with them. Let God, God will deal with, how many people know God's a better disciplinary than you? God will deal with his children. For those the Lord loves, he disciplines. You don't have to get involved. And they rescued him. When the church knew that people wanted to kill him, the church rescued him. God says, I will build a defense upon you. How? Through his people. And to be a member of of the family of God brings amazing protection into your heart and into your life. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, I don't have time to talk about it, but it talks about if a brother is overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restoring one, or if a brother is overtaken in sexual immorality, how do you handle it? Well, let me just, I got to say that. I'm out of time, but listen, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. This is New Testament. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, as such as sexual immorality. You, what, what they had here in the church of Corinth was a dumpster fire of a church. You had a, you had a, you had a, a young man who was sleeping with his father's wife, and they was in the church. And Paul, you got to remember, Corinth was like today. There was no gender to be called a Corinthian was like, it was like you are a, one of the most sexual, immoral people. They had no gender. They, they, were, they were like, there's no men, there's no women, there's no male nor female. They, they served a, a god, Diane. They served, there was a whole women's uh, movement of women power. And there was no, there was a this total destruction of the family. You had... Uh, people marrying uh, multiple people and then what marriage was was all destroyed. It was totally like it is today. And you had a church in the city <laughs> and the church had let the culture of the people get into the church. And they was just love is love, love is love, love is love. Like it is today. When you go and target in a big display, love is love. Total wicked and ungodly. We're writing a kid's book right now called The Rainbow, God's Promise. So we can let our kids know what the rainbow really means. Get mad if you want. I don't care. And, and love is love. That's why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. It wasn't for you to just read at your wedding. He was like, we need something for weddings here. The reason he wrote it was because they said love is love. And that's why he wrote... 1 Corinthians 13, to bring the church, 1 Corinthians, because Corinth was a mess. And he wrote 1 Corinthians 13 as the love chapter to tell them what love is. Yes. Love is patient and love is kind. Love keeps no record of wrongs. It's not easily provoked. It thinketh no evil, doeth no evil. Love never fails. Do I think with the, speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love? It profited me. And he wrote what love is. Yes. Because he was in, the church was in a world of just love is love. Yes. See, when you don't know your Bible, you, you fall 
for, for anything because it sounds good to the flesh. This is why the Bible says, let the scriptures dwell richly in your heart. And Paul wrote this, and he says, there's sexual immorality. And he says, if, verse 3, put on the screen, for I indeed, as absent from the body, but present in spirit, I have already judged as though I were present. See, when you judge, you have to judge according to the scriptures. The Bible doesn't say not to judge. It says, but the same measure you judge, you'll be judged back. You have to judge according to the word of God. That's what the Bible says. Judge, judge, the, the, script, judge the, 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 the prophets and see if they're according to the word of God. Verse 4, in the name of Jesus Christ, who you are gathered together along with my spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of the what? Of the flesh, that their spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Paul is talking to the church. He's talking about the power of togetherness and oneness. And he talks about if you, if you remove someone from fellowship, that what happens is when they're removed from fellowship, he says, turn them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. What is the destruction of the flesh? The destruction of the flesh is, is when somebody comes out from covering, when they come out from the body, when they come out from that spiritual authority, they open themselves up to demonic Attack and harassment by the enemy. And in the church today, many people are harassed by demonic spirits because they have no covenant with the body of Christ. They just live in like this perpetual church hop, visitor hop. They're not committed to the body. Well, I have a covenant with God. You cannot have a covenant with God without the church. Well, I have a covenant with God without the church. Show me your evidence. Show me the evidence of that. There is no evidence of that. Jesus says, I pray that you and I in the church would be one as the Father and I are one. It is his body. Oneness. Everybody say oneness. oneness. Catherine Kuhlman even said, if we have unity in the church, no one will remain sick. No one. Because in Acts 5, when the Holy Spirit fell, the Bible says they were all healed. Everybody say they were all healed. They were all healed. And I pray that our church, as I get ready to close, would be a New Testament church. How do people want to be a part of a New Testament church? A New Testament church. Let's just throw our hands up and pray that. Everybody say, Lord, make us a New Testament church. And I'm not talking about denominations. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about bondage. I'm not talking about control. I'm talking about fellowship with each other and the body of Christ. Everybody say, do it in my life, Lord. And listen to me before we pray. I've been pastoring for over 20 years in the Twin Cities. Yeah, I know this culture. I know what passive aggressive means. I know about Minnesota goodbyes. And I have to say goodbye 12 times before you get off the phone with somebody. Okay, all right, you too. Okay now, all right, okay, okay, all right, we'll, okay. I know this place. And people who are not planted, hear me, they're always in trouble. They're always troubled by something. They're always hopping in and out. They're like these trees. And they have no fruit. And let, get planted in the house of God. Everybody say get planted. Get planted in the house of the Lord. And, and let God, listen to me. Let God begin to grow you slowly. It doesn't happen quick. I know all of us want to just like run to the end. It don't work like that. God deals with his people slowly. It's like a tree. Go watch a, t a tree grow. <laughs> go, <laughs> go watch a tree grow. What is wrong with you? I'm watching the tree grow. Look at it. Look at it. Look, watch it. Oh, my God. You can't see no tree grow. What you tree is, a, you see a tree survive the storms and the winds and the waves. You see it grow. 
You know, oh, it's fruitful. And some of you, you come into the church, you're not fruitful right away. You're not fruitful right away. That's okay. Every tree, every tree, when you first plant a tree, I, my uncle, he's got mango trees in the Bahamas. He, he said, oh, I just plant a mango tree. It's going to take, you know, seven years to get mangoes. But then when, then when it bears, it's like, oh my gosh, we're going to do all these mangoes. You know, that's what it's like. Let God, give yourself the grace to let God mold you and make you. Don't even compare yourself to other people in here. Some of you just need to sit under the word of the Lord faithfully. Some of you, we don't even need you to do anything necessarily. It's like, just sit down because your attitude is not good. And... <laughs> What you're telling people is not biblical. Well, you mean well. I'm not talking. I can pick on Agnes because she's been with me. She's been with me for 20 years. I can pick on her, but I'm not talking about her. But, but you just, some of you just need, honest to God, some of you, the greatest thing that you could do in your walk with Jesus is just come to church every Sunday. That's simple. And just sit under the word of the Lord and read the word and study the word and let the word shape you and mold you into the person that he has called you to be. This is really what it takes for you to become what the Lord has called you to be and just fall in love with him. Can I get an amen? amen. This is the heart of God for the church. This is, this is how you know when you really love Jesus. Because you just burn first and think later. That's how you know when you're in love. <laughs> when all the married people say amen. All the people who got a bunch of kids. Did you plan to have eight kids? Nope. <laughs> just in love. And now we're like, man, we got eight kids. Should have thought about this. Just fall in love with Jesus. Did you get something out of this today? Come on, give God a praise. Come on, give God a praise. Amen.